Darryl Seligman, Professor of Astronomy in Michigan State University. Hi, Darryl. Thanks for Hi, being hello. here with us. Thanks for having me. It's great it's to be here. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, I would like to know uh, uh, what is your answer about uh, these messages uh, from the from the NASA. What do you think uh, about this explain about this explanation? Yeah, no, this is super exciting. So um, <laughs> it's really, really exci exciting to see that we have finally presented all of the data that we took on this object in the last couple of months to the both the scientific community and the general public. Because essentially what happened is that we have 3i Atlas discovered this very exciting interstellar object. We only have one shot at it. So the observations that we get now are the only chance in not only our lifetime, but the lifetime of the solar system to study this object. Because it comes and goes and it's never coming back. And it's a time capsule of information from another planetary system outside of our solar system. And then it was as exciting as it was to kind of be in part of the discovery in July 1st, we then had the unfortunate event where we basically weren't able to point our ground-based telescopes at Dry Atlas during the most interesting time when it was closest to the sun. You really want to look when it's closest to the sun because that's when you get the most holistic view of the nucleus of a comet. And the great thing is that although we couldn't see it from Earth, all of NASA's space-based assets were able to look at it. And they just weren't able to release that information because of the government shutdown. So it's extremely exciting to get all the information released right now. Darryl, uh, I think that the, the question is clear. Uh, can we trust in the in the NASA? Can we trust? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, in the in the NASA, can we trust in the in the image uh, the explanations about the how the NASA can we trust in them? Right. Yes. Absolutely. So I mean, this is kind of how science works. Usually, it's not just a big press release. So it kind of had to be this time because we had all of this information that wasn't able to get out because of the government shutdown. What's going to happen is that all of the data that is taken will be submitted to journals, scientific journals, and then peer reviewed. And then the statements that we make about the conclusions that we draw from that data about the Atlas will get peer reviewed by experts who work on comets and solar system objects and interstellar objects. So, for sure we can trust in this information coming from NASA and we can look forward to the next several weeks for seeing what the exciting results and interpretation from that data are about the Atlas. And uh, Daryl, what do you think about uh, 3i Atlas? Uh, do you think that is uh, an ordinary comet? So that's a great question. So I do not think it's an ordinary comet in the sense that every comet is not an ordinary comet. So. <laughs> There are lots of ways to answer this, but 3i Atlas isn't an ordinary comet because it's from outside of our solar system. Comets usually behave in different weird ways, but if you look at the comets in the solar system, there are some trends that appear that 3i Atlas seems to have been an outlier with regards to. So 3i Atlas, for all intents and purposes, is displaying every phenomenon that we that we know that comets display. So it has a nucleus, a rocky, icy nucleus, which is expelling gas. And basically, by looking at that gas, it tells us something about the nucleus. So the reason we're able to make those, to make any statements about the observations that we have obtained on 3i Atlas to this point is because we have gotten very good at studying comets. So the fact that 3i Atlas is kind of behaving like a comet is the reason that we're good at getting measurements and observations of this object. It is not like a typical comet, though, because one strange thing, I mean, you just heard NASA's um, press release, so Tom Statler was saying some of the kind of interesting properties. To me, the most interesting property about this object is that our, it seems to be most of the gas coming off of it is not water. So the fact that we've seen a lot of CO2 driving the activity, carbon, excuse me, carbon dioxide coming off of 3i Atlas tells me that it's potentially something very different from our regular solar system comets. And that one interpretation of that is that 
it is it formed in a similar manner to the comets in our solar system, but at a much larger distance from its host star. So where you basically need to be at a region of an exoplanetary system that's very cold to have cold temperature wise to have CO2 incorporated in the ice. So on the one hand, I'd answer you with three atlas. Yes, it is not like a typical comet because it has all these interesting properties that maybe is telling us something about how planet formation is different throughout the galaxy, but it is clearly a comet. There, Ilan, uh, what do you think about uh, the size, the speed of the three atlas? Uh, why is so different from uh, one a Omamua or Chua Iborisop? That is, a, that is an excellent question. So I think, okay, so we, to, to answer that question, we need to be more specific about what differences we're talking about. The one obvious, another difference of Thry Atlas with both the Muamua and Borisov is that it is, was moving much faster when it entered the solar system. So that I think is telling you, basically the faster an interstellar object moves through the galaxy, the older it is, because as things orbit in the galaxy, as time moves on, they basically scatter off of things like giant molecular clouds. And the cumulative effect of all of these scattering events makes objects move faster. So I think the fact that the fact that 3i Atlas is moving so much faster, was moving so much faster, excuse me, than Amuamu and Borisov is potentially telling you that it's a much older object potentially even older than the solar system. And that really could be what's exciting about that is that it could be telling you that the processes by which planets formed and comets get scattered and ejected that happen, we know happen in the solar system, potentially were happening just as efficiently and vigorously in the Milky Way at its very earliest stages. So when the Milky Way was a very young galaxy, we were also making planets and comets the same way that we do them now. And Eril, uh, we are talking a lot about this uh, three atlas because of Abel Webb, this scientific of, of Harvard. Uh, what do you think about uh, her hypothesis? Well, I mean, I think that you, you just watched NASA's press release. It's pretty, I mean, the reason that we're able to get all of these exquisite measurements of 3 Atlas with our space-based assets and with the ground-based observations and do things like what I've been talking about, measure its speed at infinity, excuse me, speed when it was entering the solar system, measure the composition, how we know that there's CO2. You heard Tom talking about, Tom Statler at NASA talking about the weird properties of the dust grains, like the weird polar, the the polarimetric measurements were a little different than we normally see. It seems like maybe there are larger dust grains than in typical solar system comets. The fact that we are so good at making all those measurements is because we have been making those measurements of comets for decades. This object has, ever since, it's, ever since we discovered this object, it has displayed every characteristic of a comet. So, the reason that we're able to get these interesting measurements is because it is a comet and we have been studying it and measuring it just like we measure every other comet. And do you think that AB Loeb is helping or is harming the, the scientific community? I think that is a question that the scientific, the scientific community in general is, feels, um, Maybe split on, so I think it depends on who you ask. Well, uh, waiting for more uh, reports about Avilo, uh, I would like to ask you about uh, if you think that we have a, a four I in the in the future. You think that three Atlas uh, will be the, the last for more interstellar objects in the future? Is that what you were asking? Yeah. Oh yes. So this is extremely exciting. So. Even just discovering a Muamua in the last 10 years, I mean, not even 10 years, but approximately 10 years, if we discovered a Muamua in Atlas, forgetting about Borisov even, that tells you that there's about one similar object in the inside of Earth's orbit at any given time that we're not seeing. And that corresponds to about 100,000-ish interstellar objects inside of Neptune's orbit. And if you go to the whole galaxy, we're talking about 
something like 10 to the 26 interstellar objects in the galaxy. So that means for sure we will be, we have the, there should be many more of these objects that we could detect. It is not at all like 2017 was special and that was the only time an interstellar object came through our solar system. We just managed to discover it at that point in time. So for sure there are other objects out there to discover, but we just, just almost contemporaneous with the discovery of 3i Atlas, we had the first light of the Rubin the Barra Rubin Observatory LSST. LSST in the Atacama Desert is going to look at the entire southern, it is currently operating, it is looking at the entire southern hemisphere every night, basically, to about five orders of magnitudes more sensitivity than any all sky survey that we've ever had before. And that means that we should be just that much better at discovering interstellar objects in the next several years. So I expect that we'll start discovering these objects at least a couple every year from now on. And uh, the real, uh, what can we learn about these uh, three agendas uh, for the future? How can you, how can help uh, to the scientific community? So one thing that, so the most, so, okay, I'm just getting excited because I've also been, I, thank you for that question because I've also been thinking about that. One exciting thing is that Dry Atlas, we're going to be able to look at it through the spring maybe even into the summer. So we, as astronomers, we can get data on this fantastic object for several months. And there is a, re like there is data at any point in time on 3i Atlas throughout its trajectory is valuable. You heard the people at NASA talking about that. Data when we couldn't look from Earth, when it was closest to the sun was super valuable because that was when the comet's at its warmest. However, you also heard them talking about there was a question in the Q&A that they addressed about what was the processing like as that as the Atlas traveled through the galaxy. So we have an opportunity not only to learn about exoplanetary systems, but what happens to comets as they travel through the interstellar medium of the galaxy. So as we look at 3i Atlas as it kind of leaves the solar system, that's potentially going to tell you about material which is further in of the nucleus of the object and maybe tell you about how that processing in the interstellar medium occurred on an interstellar object. That's like, effectively, that's an that is something that we've tried to learn about in lab experiment experiments for the last couple of decades. But the interstellar objects like Oumuamua, Tuai Borisov, Atlas, and then all of the future ones we're going to discover, that gives us an unprecedented window into not only planet formation around other stars, but what is the environment like as these objects move in the interstellar medium. And the, 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 the last question, uh, what can we expect uh, from, from the 19th of December? Uh, could we see a better image of these uh, three atlas? Right, so for people at home interested in looking at three atlas, um, it will not be, you cannot see it with just your eyes. So it's not a naked eye comet, but it is possible from some locations on the Earth that you'd be able to see it with a good amateur a, a amateur astronomer telescope. So you don't need a big fancy telescope like LSST or James Webb Space Telescope to see this object. It is possible if you have a powerful enough amateur telescope that just with an eyepiece to try to look at this object if you're kind of in or close to one of the right areas where you could see it from. So I'd recommend definitely wherever you are now looking up when and where you could see the object from and then trying to find a place which is far away from light pollution, so far away from city lights, and as high up as you can get to try to stake out a view on when it's close in December, when it's closest to the Earth. You don't also have to go that date. You could go basically starting after December 1st, but you know the la later weeks in December will be better, but you could potentially see it with an amateur um, telescope. In fact, I've been getting images that amateur astronomers are sending me with their, with their telescopes pretty much every day. So um, that is, it can be a very valuable, not only is it can be exciting for you to go and look at it, that can be a very valuable contribution to the scientific community. Well, uh, waiting for this uh, 19th of December, uh, Larry, thanks, thank you so much for being here with wow. us in the office today. It's a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you.